Hello and welcome to another edition of What Does the Giraffe Say Media with me, Kathleen Ritorne. We're an organisation that aims to connect people in conservation by holding live interviews on social media. Today we're going to be talking all things hippos as we're heading over to Zimbabwe to talk to Karen and she's from the Turgway Hippo Trust Foundation. So Karen, if I could just hand over to you, I know that you've had a bit of a similar experience to me in terms of your, your background and while you've always loved animals, it wasn't always what you did professionally. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your journey and how you ended up making animals and wildlife your career? Well, first of all, Kathleen, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, it's really a pleasure to be with you. And um, yeah, how did I get to be to this situation? Um, dogged determination and focus. Um, but basically, as a child, I, I grew up in England, like yourself. And I had a passion for animals, like most people from a little girl. Not to say that you can't have a passion at any time in your life for something. It's just I happened to be a child when I when I got my thing about animals. Um, I my mum worked in a what they called a petting zoo, where children and adults could come along and pet animals like uh, guinea pigs, rabbits, um, and also exotic animals, a llama and foxes and a gibbon and what have you. So I had an ideal child life um, childhood. Uh, from the age of uh, seven until 12 at a place called Woburn Abbey in Bedfordshire at this little zoo. It wasn't really a zoo, but anyway. Um, my father, my biological father was a vet. Um, I never met him, but possibly his genes rubbed off on me. Um, and between my mum and him, I think they had some influence for sure. Um, I grew up with every animal you can imagine, from a snake, I like snakes very much, um, to uh, uh, stick insects, uh, hedgehogs, rabbits, cats, dogs, a pony, uh, uh, that's a baboon in the background <laughs> screaming, by the way, uh, a pony, um, various other animals, and I always had them in my life. And I could um, relate to animals probably better than with people, in a way, I was an only child at that stage. Um, anyway, so... I wanted, from the age of about nine, I started to have this fixation to come to Africa. And it started with my mum lending me or reading me a book and helping me read it, uh, Born Free, about a lioness called Elsa and George Adamson. And that created in me then, as a little girl, the need to go to Africa because the lion had been um, hand reared and then put back where she belonged in the bush as a wild animal. Um, but at the age of 15, I joined a circus uh, in the school holidays, which now I'm horrified that I even thought about that. But as a little girl, I thought, like most people, circuses were fun things um, and not cruel to the animals. And only by living for three weeks in my holiday school holidays with them did I realize the kind of things that they, the animals had to put up with. Their handlers, the people that looked after them, not their owners, but the handlers loved the animals and they gave them as much love as they could. But they were used as a business and it wasn't any life for an animal and especially not lions, uh, bears, even the horses. It wasn't really right because they only got exercise in the ring. But I learned a heck of a lot and realized circuses would not be for me ever again. Um, and then um, I studied, as you probably know, journalism, and I was going to be a journalist and started off as a copywriter in a very small office in my hometown. Um, but an incident occurred that was heavy. A guy got killed and uh, I actually knew him. He was a tramp and I'd befriended him and was giving him um, food and things. And then he got murdered. And of course, that hit the papers and was very um, successful for my office. But I didn't like it because um, it was making money out of his death and I couldn't handle that. So I quit journalism. Then I went, of all places, totally away from the bush and from the wildlife into a casino as a croupier. I had no idea what a casino was, um, but my cousin conned me into an interview, long story, and I ended up as a croup. But through being a croupier, I met a guy who had worked in Victoria Falls in a casino there. And so on every break from, from being on the tables dealing, we talked to Africa and we talked in particular Zimbabwe and Victoria Falls. And he said he would get me a job 
in Vic Falls. So I kind of thought he was joking, but to cut another story, very condensed. I get a phone call 10 days later, Karen, will you come to Vic Falls? We'll pay your air ticket. So there I was going to Zimbabwe and my mum nearly had a heart attack. She was back in Bedfordshire, Buckinghamshire. And I said, mum, I'm going to Africa. And I told her that when I was a little girl, but now I really was going. And then I arrived and then I had to get over um, people looking at me as a croupier and not as a person that wanted to work seriously in the bush with wild animals because croupiers kind of have a reputation of being makeup and high heeled shoes and all this sort of stuff, which is very much not what I am, but it was a means to an end. I enjoyed the job. It was a good job, but not my cup of tea. Yeah. So I started getting out in the bush as much as I could and getting experience with people that knew the bush, um, the odd boyfriend as well, who taught me a hell of a lot about the bush, but it wasn't getting me anywhere. And then eventually I started putting ads in the newspaper, girl looking to work in the bush. And all I got was a whole load of guys wanting to get married. <laughs> <laughs> so that didn't work and then a friend of a friend knew a guy and this guy was much to my horror now but then i didn't understand the whole scene uh he was a professional hunter who was working in the lofa on his own property in the southeast lofa where i am now and he wanted to stop hunting and he wanted to do photographic safaris he also wanted to employ a girl as a professional guide which nobody had ever done it was always boys it wasn't girls uh, he was very far thinking, great guy. So he employed me and that started my career as a safari guide. Uh, I was the first girl in the country to get the professional guides license. Luckily, when I did it, it, it wasn't what it is now. Um, now it's the, the law in, in Zimbabwe that you have to, when you, you do the guides license, you have to be able to handle killing an animal, which is an elephant or a buffalo or both. Mm -hmm. um, because you've got to be able to protect your clients. But when I did it, no girl had ever done it. So yeah. that wasn't on board at that stage. So I actually didn't have to kill an animal. I think had I have had to have done that, I wouldn't have been a guide because I'm a vegetarian and I don't kill animals. Um, but I understand the reasoning behind it. But I can shoot a gun. I'm actually very good with a, with a rifle, but not kill animals. I'm just good at targets. Anyway, I got the job. Now I'm in the bush. And I'm actually in the low felt um, where we are now, but in a different part from here. And uh, it's great. And I'm learning every day something new. But the biggest thing is when you're a safari guide, you're working with tourists and you're not really having the animal side of the equation because the tourism is the main thing. So your thing is to get up at four in the morning, go to bed at midnight if your clients go to bed at midnight and be up again at four in the morning and take them in the bush and give them the best you can give them. And if you're a good guy, you've got to be able to chat and you've got to be able to show those animals that they want to see. So although you get to see them, you are 900% concentrating on your client and not on the animal, although you're watching your animal, but you're with your client. And it wasn't what I wanted. What I wanted to work with animals and not with people. I wanted to work with animals only. Then George Adamson contacted me. Um, we'd been writing for uh, quite a few years and he offered me a job in Kenya. But he said, come up and check it out. Now, George is the guy responsible for the film Born Free, him and his wife. And he was in his 80s then. But anyway, I went, I took my mum because uh, she had come out and moved to the country after I came here. And uh, we went to Kenya and I met George. I met a lion called Lucifer, who he was rehabilitating at that stage. And he offered me a job. Um, but he was in his 80s. Um, he was very much with it. Fantastic man, gentleman. I, I loved him to bits. But he maybe, if he was lucky, had another 10 years in the bush. And I would be giving up Zimbabwe. I'd be giving up everything I'd achieved so far. And I'd be giving up my animals, which I had pussy cats and a dog, Cocker Spaniel, but I knew I couldn't take them to the bush in Kenya. But I was I was 90% sure. Can you hear the baboons? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's dark and they're still arguing. Um, I was 90% sure that I would um, um, take the job. But for my mum, after leaving George, and I told George I would be coming, we went to Malindi, the coast in Kenya. And I meet 
my husband-to-be, Jean-Roger Paulilo, a very good-looking Frenchman, French-Italian actually, but born in France. And it was literally, as they say, love at, at first sight, um, literally. And we hit it off, bam. Um, so much so that I found myself, um, I think it was three months later, visiting him where he lived in Holland, where he was working for an oil um, company, Shell. And uh, my whole life then went on to a completely different tangent. I'm in love, I'm with a guy, we end up getting married, it's all magic. But I then realized I can't live anymore in Europe. I'd been in Africa, I'd been in the bush. I was, to put it bluntly, going mad. I loved my husband. I loved the adventure of Holland. I'd never been there before, but I was so claustrophobic. I actually had panic attacks, believe it or not, on buses. Yeah. Um, I couldn't handle being back in civilization, which sounds stupid, but when you're used to living like we live here, or which we weren't then, but I'd lived in the bush, it's such a different world. Yeah. So long story cut short, Jean talks his boss into sending us back to Africa um, because the doctor had told him that my his wife was perfectly healthy mentally and physically, she just was homesick. So he mm -hmm. told the boss that and he had a great boss and we ended up going to West Africa, Gabon. And it was fantastic, everything was perfect. I was back in the bush. Um, I met bush people and got out there and I actually was meeting gorillas and pygmy elephants and all was magic. And then unfortunately politics moved in, which can happen in Africa. And um, there were riots and people started getting killed. And to put it bluntly, Shell panicked um, because they're responsible for their workers. So in we were in the jungle, but in the cities they um, they basically evacuated all their women, their wives and children. And, and then the men, then the men went. We were in a place called Gamba in the jungle and there was only a small community of us and we were allowed to stay there for a while and then they decided, no, it wasn't safe. All women and children out, husbands to stay behind. If it got hectic, they'd leave overnight sort of thing. Uh, they made a, pr made, made a law though, no animals, no pets. And everybody started to put to sleep their dogs and their cats. Yeah, I'm afraid there was no ways I was going to mm -hmm. do that. My cats had come from Zimbabwe to Holland and back to West Africa. Mm -hmm. So they weren't going to be put to sleep. And I had four cats, two from Holland and two from Zimbabwe. So I rocked every boat on the planet because you don't to a corporation as a wife say, hey, man, I'm not leaving. But it's basically what happened. My husband stuck by with by me because he's a great guy. And we didn't leave. And all the people left, um, the, the main staff, um, then the contractors were the last ones left. They lived in another part of the, the area. And I, and me, I was the only one left in the, the compound where, where we lived. And I was causing a lot of havoc for, for the people, the employees, the employers, because I was still there. And I said, I'll go if I can go with my cats. Otherwise, I'm not going. So... Uh, that's what happened. Um, we actually were allowed, they said, okay, you can take two of the four, no suitcase, because you were allowed one suitcase. Um, so we put the, the raffle in a hat and drew out two of my cats. They weren't even my, my favorite one, Smudgy. I freaked out. We went to the airport. The contractors were there. No, the, the last shell people were there going out. And I was howling. I was crying my heart out because two cats were staying behind. And John was promising me that if he got evacuated, cats would go with him, but he knew he couldn't because they wouldn't let him. Yeah. And a friend of ours who was a doctor there, a French doctor, he looked at me and he said, Karen, I won't quote what he said in English French, but he said, go home. So we did. So we took the cats and we went back home. <laughs> and that rocked even more boats. So eventually they came back to us and they said, right, the only way to get rid of your wife is you take her out, you're in trouble. You take your, your cat and you leave. And he, they actually allowed us, I think, one suitcase. And we left with the contractors and we were sent via the Congo and then Switzerland and eventually got to Holland and were put in a very posh hotel and with the cats. Um, and then my husband was supposed to be in really big trouble, but he wasn't because he was a high flyer, but I was, and they didn't want me back there. But they politely said it was because no wives of, um, of, of staff could come back. 
but it wasn't actually true because wives that were secretaries and that could go back and they didn't want me and I, I understood it because I even read a, wrote a magazine in, in Gamba telling people do not buy um, like uh, parrots because they're catching them from wild parrots uh, don't buy snake skin they've killed the snake to give you the skin and then there was a lady next door who was buying ivory the ivory was covered in blood because the poacher was at her doorstep and I went bananas and shouted at her in French because I, I learned I could swear in French and basically said this is a poacher this is this is blood and eventually <laughs> the poacher got so scared of me he gapped her and she didn't buy her ivory um, but it was heavy it, it you know people didn't understand and when I wrote that article I actually had a hell of a lot of um, shell people coming to me, the ladies, and saying we never realized. And yeah. they were very sorry that they'd bought these things because they just didn't realize that these animals were wild. They were used to pet shops in Europe, not Africa, and wild animals being caught to trade. So that, that was probably another reason Shell didn't want me back there. I, t I totally understand it. So then John got me sent back here to Zimbabwe to my mum. And then he joined me because we were due to have a holiday. And then he quit and he went back and he quit. And he said, no, no wife, no Jean Roger. I've got a fantastic husband. And um, so we, they tried to keep him, but they wouldn't let me come back. So then we came back to Zim and on our way back, my mum had met a geologist who was looking for another geologist to work in the low felt, literally um, 65 kilometers from where I'd been a safari guide here on the Turgui River. And the job was for Jean to work in exploration to look for gold and diamonds. Um, and we would be camping and living in the bush. So Jean said, what the hell? It's, it's a, a quickie, we'll do it for six months. Um, and the money was like a hundred thousand times smaller than what he'd earned. And it was Zimbabwe dollars. So it wasn't yeah. even all you could use. And um, we were just camping. We, we had a, a caravan for our animals because I had my cats and my dog. And we, um, my dog came back to me when I got back to Zim. And um, we were camped above the Turgui River and it was going to be six months. Well, um, that was 1990 and we're still here. <laughs> and then how was it that the idea then to set up the, the Hippo Trust came about? What was, what was the situation here that made you go, okay, this is what we're going to focus on? Okay, well, again, fate can work in very weird ways. I'm a great believer in it. Um, we had been here more than six months. We'd been here just under a year because Jean fell in love with the environment because it's totally pristine. There's no man-made anything around us, nothing at all. Um, and we'd, we'd said, okay, it'll be a year. And then when you work in the bush, when you live in the bush, signs of nature tell you things all the time and it's a newspaper. And it was obvious a drought was coming, a heavy one, just by what the animals were doing, what the ants were doing, what all sorts of things are doing. So I approached what was then the owners of the land we were on at that stage. And he has a, a huge ranch, um, 19 Ks from us. And I said, there's gonna be a drought. What's the story with the wildlife? And at that stage, this wasn't the Savi Valley Conservancy. This was cattle ranching. And he right. said, well, I've got 3,000 head of cattle. I'm going to look after my cattle. I'm going to feed what I can, which will be my rhinos. They've got white and black rhino. And uh, everything else will have to take its chance. So I basically said, well, I've got to know the hippos on our doorstep, literally 15 of them. Can I feed them? Yeah. And Roger, the guy, laughed at me. And he basically said, if you think a pommy can feed a bunch of hippos in the bush, try it. And laughed at me. And I love a challenge. And also I'm a workaholic. Um, so I approached, first of all, experts in zoos in England, actually, England and I think America, asking, how do you feed a hippo? What do you feed a hippo? And how? And they had all fed in zoos, but never in the bush. And eventually a guy I knew in the low felt, Clem Putzia, told me how to feed them in a boma short period he'd, he'd fed hippos like when you capture and you release to another area and he'd fed for like I think two weeks maximum I ended up feeding for 10 months and he told me one adult hippo would eat 15 kilograms of hay and a couple of kilograms of horse cubes or game nuts 
one adult. Well, it turned out that one adult hippo actually eats 45 kilograms of hay, three times that amount, and about four kgs of game nuts, plus a lot of other goodies to keep him happy. Um, so my feeding bill turned out I was feeding one ton of food a night for 13 hippos. Two of the hippos had dispersed, both died. And out of the 27 hippos that were in the entire Turgui River, when I first came here, I did a count of the entire river. Only my 13 that I fed survived the entire drought. Mm -hmm. It was such a good feeding program that two females got pregnant. And one of the calves, Timbai, is now the bull in charge up at uh, what we call the Majehui Weir, which is about six kilometers from our home. And he's now fathered, oh, I can't remember how many, but I've, I've had from 13 hippos, 67 hippo calves born since 1992. Well, 1990, I had one calf, but after that, since 1992. And That's the fantastic. food they were fed, well, exactly, the, the food they were fed, the monies came from complete and utter strangers. It started off with uh, my husband. I pinched 3,000 pounds off him and I never gave it back. <laughs> and that started us off feeding. Um, then I approached um, everybody I could think of and eventually Care for the Wild International in England, who were then run by the Jordans, sent a guy out to the low felt. Um, he went to see one lady and then he came to see me. And because I was physically feeding by then, he backed me um, because they could see it was for real. I was doing it. It was happening. So Care for the Wild um, put a hell of a lot of money into what I was doing. They also um, paid for a pan we built. We, we built a pan because we lost the river. The entire Turgui River completely dried up. So we built a pan. The hippos had water then. We built troughs so they could drink clean water because they defecate in their own water. And the pan was like a, a, a cesspit. <laughs> um, and um, it was a success. And I also had ordinary people, first of all in Zimbabwe, because I was writing for a wildlife magazine, a diary every month. So Zimbabweans gave money. And uh, that's the pan. Yeah, that's the one we built in 1992. And that mm -hmm. had uh, 12 of the 13 hippos living in it at night. They didn't stay in the daytime. Um, but at night, we've still got it. It's still got water in it. It's fantastic. Oh, I think there's been a little bit of a delay there coming yeah, through. Now. That cost, I think. Sorry. Sorry, there was a little bit of a delay there. Sorry, <clears throat> it just got uh, a bit a bit glitchy, but we're okay. We're back up and running. Okay. Anyway, the pan cost eight thousand pounds, which Care for the Wild funded, and we built it. We had piping laid nineteen k's to our neighbours, who allowed us. It seems that we've gone a little bit glitchy again. She is, as she mentioned earlier, in the middle of the bush. So sometimes these things are bound to happen. Hopefully it will revert back to normal in a minute and we can have their pins that they had clean water to do. In the meantime, thank you everyone back home um, who's watching. Thank you for all the lovely comments. There's lots of people from all around the world and many people send in lots and lots of love and support, which is awesome to see. Karen, I might suggest to you if you log back out and try logging back in on the same link, hopefully then that can bring you back in. Um, I know a lot of people online watching at the moment are asking about Steve. I'll let Karen talk to you about that because I know this is a hippo that is very... Um, uh, very close to a lot of people's hearts. If you have any questions that you'd also like me to put towards Karen, then please do so. Just pop it in the comments section and I'll be able to do that for you. So it looks like she's going to be able to come back in shortly. Um, she's living off a generator. They don't have any electricity where they are. So it does mean that these things are bound to happen. But appreciate you guys for sticking with us and staying as we are watching. Um, while we're talking, when she comes back, we're also going to be covering things such as why hippos are known as the most dangerous mammal and if they deserve this reputation. We're also going to be talking about what she's learned as she's been studying hippos for a very long time, any unusual behavior and things like that that she's seen. 
and also why they're um, important to the ecosystem. Um, alongside the biggest challenges, support, and what she hopes to do in the future. So we've got plenty to cover. So hopefully she's going to be able to come back in. Worst case scenario, if that's not the case, we'll reschedule it for another day and we'll be able to continue the conversation. But hopefully that we'll be able to do that. Um, again, thank you for watching. If you are enjoying, please do give it a like, comment and share. The more people who see it, the more awareness we can raise for this wonderful organization and these incredible animals. And it all helps to kind of raise awareness. And some people might not even be aware of hippos. And this is something that we can do to raise awareness. So I really appreciate any of your support that you can do. We've got some lovely comments coming through from people all over the world. We've got people coming from Uganda, Nigeria, Holland. Um, where else have we got? Zimbabwe, South Africa, Hungary. It's brilliant, absolutely fantastic to see the reach that we're getting. Um, so, yeah, I know, as I say, someone else here is saying about Steve's. Hi, Linda. Thank you for commenting. Um, as I say, yeah, we will, we will try and touch on that for you. Um, and we've also got a question coming through from Leslie. So, yes, yeah, she, she is open to visitors. Hold on one second. I can see Karen coming back in. There we go, Karen. <laughs> Don't know what happened there. That's we okay. On, I think... on a satellite <laughs> dish. Yeah, people understand. That's totally fine. Thank you for being able to bounce back in. Um, so we were talking about your project um, and the stuff that you're doing at your centre. And actually, while you were off camera, someone was asking if you were able to take volunteers and visitors. Um, they wanted to come over in September. September. Unfortunately, September's booked this year. Um, we've got four people from England coming. And we do take volunteers, yes. Um, they have to make a donation for being here because um, that's how we run the trust. But it actually, the, the, the volunteer period is from May through till September. After that, we're too hot. Um, anybody from England would drop dead. It's like 45 degrees. It's not fun. It's hot. Yeah, that's fair enough. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. And I hope that answers your question, Leslie. And I hope you still will manage to have a fantastic time in Zimbabwe. Um, hippos are known as one of the most dangerous uh, mammals. There's a lot of people, there's a lot of misconceptions about them. Why do they have this reputation? Is it deserved? And what do you do to try and educate about that? Okay, um, I do believe it's not deserved. Um, after nearly 30, well, 30 years of living with hippos, working with hippos, I've learned more about hippos than my husband. And they basically are very misrepresented, like so many animals in our world. And just for, for example, hyena, hippo, um, even warthogs, that, you know, baboons. Baboons get a very bad rap. And all animals, like even domestic animals, if you anger the animal or you do something cruel to it or you in any way inflict um, some kind of punishment on the animal that is not correct, you're gonna get a reaction. With a hippo, people see them as aggressive because of those teeth. Um, as you see here in front of you there is a picture of my hippos or some of the hippos, I call them my hippos, they're not mine, um, feeding in a drought. I feed in droughts when it is necessary, only when it's necessary. In 30 years, I've fed four and a half times, one half season and four full times. And I will always feed if they're gonna die because I'm protecting these animals. Um, but a hippo's mouth has got 36 teeth of which the lower canines can grow up to two feet. Uh, they weigh in a bull at about two tons up to three tons, a, mac a really big bull, one and a half tons of female. So when people see a hippo opening his mouth and producing all those teeth, it's a bit like looking into the face of a, a horror movie in some cases and people go, oh my goodness, it's dangerous. Like Bobby there. Now, Bob, as you see, he's our mascot. He, when I met him, yes, he was dangerous. Yes, he wanted to kill you. And the reason behind that was when we came here, his family and Happy's family had been trophy hunted. The females shot, the males shot. Bob did not like people. And it took me three years for that hippo to tolerate me. Um, when I first came, I, I was used to working as a guide with hippos in national parks where they're pretty passive and they don't charge out of the water at you. 
Bobby would come out of the water, blackface would come out of the water and they wanted to kill me. And I'm not joking. After three years of, of spending every day with them and talking to them, they got used to my voice. And I learned that because they are vocal animals themselves, they relate to your voice. And that animal there, Bobby, got to the stage where I could call him. He could be half a K away upstream in the river and he comes moving down to me. They can't swim. They, they go along the bottom of the river and they bounce. And he'd come like a tidal wave. You'd just see like a tidal wave. And he would bounce up in front of me at some stage 10 feet from me, opening his mouth in a gape. As you can see, his teeth were very worn out because he was an old chap even then and showing off. But because I'd spent three years studying them and now it's 30 years, I know everything about their movements in their face, their ears, their eyes, their mouths. I know when they're angry. I know when they're sad. I know when they're aggressive. I know when they're got a bad hair day you, you you just get to know them like you do your own domestic pets your dogs your pussy cats every single wild animal if you have the privilege like i do of working with them and being with them or your own wild animals in your backyard your foxes your hedgehogs if you get to study them and watch them daily you learn so much about them forget the books forget what you're told use your own brain and your own eyes and you will learn, but always, always, always respect them. Take that lady there, that's Blackface. Blackface never stopped being aggressive. She had had a very bad um, background. I learned about it through asking people about her. She had her, had had a cough and a guy, um, a European guy who was leasing a property near here, decided he was gonna capture her cough and sell it. Well, you don't do that to any mother and especially not a hippo mum. And he managed to lasso the calf at night by being up a tree and he caught it. But mummy, blackface, got the hell in. And he was very lucky to be alive because she bashed that tree and tried to nick it, knock him out the tree, which she would have done. But fortunately, the calf, the lasso came off and the calf took off and mum went after the calf. Otherwise, that guy would have been probably annihilated and he shouldn't have been capturing baby hippos anyway. <laughs> but blackface never forgot that. Plus, because of the, the trophy hunting, I think she'd seen a lot of offspring killed. She'd seen other females maybe shot, bull shot, whatever. She hated people. And she would charge. I could be up on top of the riverbank. I could be 300 feet from where she was down in the riverbank, sort of like 80 feet below me, but far away, 300 feet away. She would smell me and she'd charge out of the water. That's how cross she was with humans. Yeah. But over the years, she mellowed. She was never 100% reliable. And that was great because when you work with a so-called dangerous animal, but anyway, a wild animal, you've got to be very careful not to get too cocky and too yeah. um, thinking you know everything about that animal. You mustn't believe that you have control on that animal because you certainly don't. You mustn't believe that he loves you and he's not going to hurt you or she's not going to hurt you because they're wild animals and you don't touch them. So with blackface, she, she was so good for me because she kept me um, knowing that these animals were hippos and that she could be naughty if you pushed her. But again, it was all circumstances. She was not, they're not naturally like that. that every hippo doesn't see a human and try and kill it. Yes, they kill people. But so do elephants, so do buffalo, so do lion, and so do some dogs. So Lots do mosquitoes. Of kill people, and it's so do mosquitoes. Yeah, I've had malaria twenty times. Tell me about it. Um, <laughs> an animal will, will kill someone or hurt someone if they've been hurt, if they've been sorted badly, treated badly. There are rogue animals. There are animals that are their hormones are jumping. There are animals that something has happened in their life and, the, and it's a bad day for them that day. That is why in the wild, you never, never, never take them for granted. But you don't have to walk around with a gun pointed at them. I don't carry a weapon. I don't need it. I had to as a safari guide, but I don't now and I haven't done for years. And neither do the African people in our area. You don't need a weapon to be in the bush. You need your brain, your eyes, your nose, your ears and your senses. And the Tur Turkey Hippo Trust, which is what I run, and I've run since 1994, was, was made so that we could protect these hippo 
for the rest of their lives, the rest of my life, and there on after. In the, it wasn't just me feeding hippos in 1992 to save their lives. I couldn't walk away from them. We ended up buying our property, building a house, and we now live here, and we've been here ever since. And my husband, who was a geologist, he still does a little bit every now and again, is now a trustee on my trust, and I'm, I tell him what to do. <laughs> Not really, <laughs> but he... He does the books and he, he's very, very, he does all the man things. I'm a woman. I don't do machines and cars and generators. Sean does that. So it's fantastic. And I have a board of trustees. We are also uh, in Canada. We have Friends of the Turkey Hippo Trust in Canada. We have Friends of the Turkey Hippo Trust now in America. We have just got our 501C number, which means all Americans' money is tax exempt. Mm -hmm. The Turkey Hippo Trust has grown phenomenally. But it would never, never, never have grown without people and without all the people that have helped me in the last 30 years. And I've got people everywhere but in this country, really. All my people helping me are in England, America, Canada, Australia. And they're volunteers, many of them. And many of them have been here and, and met the animals and seen what we do and realized that, that we live in the wild. We live with lion. We live with ellies. Uh, we live in the bush. We don't have electricity. We have a, a satellite dish. But I am so passionate about what we do here and I will be till I drop dead and I'll probably be afterwards anyway. <laughs> we have a question coming through from Linda Walsh. Hi, Linda. Um, she said, it's amazing how you, you name all the hippos and know them. How do you know who, who is in the, in the bloke? Very, very good question. At first it was very difficult and it's still difficult with the babies when I've got a lot of babies. This year I've got five up with Timbai and when they're similar ages, it's hard. You can't sex a baby hippo. Well, you can't sex a hippo in water. You need to see it on land, unless it's a bull. That's obvious. He's a big guy, big head, whatever. But babies, the calves, um, you need to see them on land. And their their um, their sheath, you, you can't see. Their, their testicles are tucked up. So basically, it's a matter of looking for the sheaths. Um, and in a little one, I've made a few mistakes. My hippos get adopted. I have a adopt a hippo project to raise funds for the Turkey Hippo Trust. So on the, the website, they can be adopted. And um, often the odd person has adopted, say, for example, Henry, who's turned out to be Henrietta, yeah. um, like six months or a year later, when I've actually really been able to identify with binoculars and actually see for sure what we've got. But they laugh about it and they accept it. Um, to see them the, the best way to ID obviously is in water because they spend half the year only in water and half the year on land in the in the winter, our winter. So I learned to look for visible scars on their faces that are permanent scars, a nick in the ear, like a cut from the bushes or from a lion or whatever, um, and anything that stands out. Obviously, like with all lots of animals, when I when I had once in my life a lot of cattle, not for meat as pets, believe it or not, I knew every cow's face because when you work with an animal constantly day in, day out, spending six, seven hours with it, you know its face. So all the adults I know easily, but it took time and it took things like scars and nicks in the ear. And once you've got that, then you've got a, a grounding. And because I have a, a husband who is a scientist, I've got graphs and details and footprints and you name it for the last 30 years. And we've we've had a few while again while um while you were connecting back into the into the studio we had a few comments um touching on one of your hippos who I know is very dear to your heart um on Steve and there's people are asking if there's there's been any updates and um, are you able to tell us a little bit more about this? I am um, yeah it it's it's highly emotional for me yes um, in that Steve there he is is something that I never dreamed would happen. After 30 years of being with them, yes, I have I have uh, had always a bond with them. And Bobby, as I say, he became a hippo that came within six feet, uh, 10 feet of me in the water and I was on, the, on land. And he would come for television crews who filmed him. He was amazing. And I've had other hippos similar to Bobby. Bob was very special, but I have never, in my, all these years, had a hippo that comes to the house or was coming to the house. And Stevie, like all young males, when they reach a certain age, which uh, don't listen to the books because the books are wrong. I, I've proved over the years that so many things 
that are written about hippos are not correct. When a hippo reaches around two and a half years of age, he's weaned. Not at eight months, at two and a half years. He's still suckling in its proper milk until he's two and a half. When mummy is pregnant again, when the cow is pregnant, she has to get rid of the cough because her udder is now going to fill up for the next cough. And if it's a male, she's very aggressive towards it because she's got to push him away from that udder. If it's a female, she's also aggressive, but it's allowed to stay in the, in the bloat, in the pod, but not a male. So from the age of two and a half, if mother is pregnant again, or older, if the mother is an older cow in her four to fifth year, where she'll have a cough every four years, three to four to five years, depending on the cow, the calf is lucky and might live with his mum till he's about five as a male. Stevie was unlucky, Steve, as he was named by Steve Gordon in Canada. Stevie, as I tend to call him, I put everything with a V, uh, a Y. Stevie was kicked out at the age of just over two and a, two, uh, two years and three months, I think. And that was, I think, I can't remember dates, but I think it was 2000, whoosh, I can't remember, sorry. But anyway, he was kicked out at that age and he cleverly stayed near here because the pod, uh, the bloat was down the road a bit. He stayed in this area. And then about a year later, because I lose track, I've, I've got lots of hippos I've been recording. Stevie arrived one day on our lawn at night and he proceeded to eat our very pathetic little lawn, which I was very, very happy about. But then Steve is very intelligent, like all hippos. And he wandered around to the back door and found Bonnie and Clyde, which are two bush pigs, which we feed at night because they're wild and they pitched up so they get food. Anybody that arrives at Hippo Haven has food because we are a refuge from poachers, from hunters, from anybody. They're safe at Hippo Haven. So Steve found the bush pigs, found the food, and that was it, boy. He wasn't leaving. So he started feeding on the on the on the horse cubes, the game nuts. And I was in seventh heaven because I've now got a hippo at the back door. And he was like, I think he was three and a half. I, I really lose track. He's been feeding. He's been here for two years now. In fact, no, he was a bit younger. He's five in September. And what started off with just him at the back door, like the bush pigs, I started to learn so much from him because now I'm at, I'm a few meters from a hippo and I'm seeing everything. And the first thing I see is the, the they call it sweating blood. It's a red liquid and it looks just like blood and it comes out of their, their skin and it's like the, the books will tell you it's, it's a sunscreen. Yes, I'm sure it does work as a sunscreen because I think the Japanese were going to try and figure out how to use it for that. But it is also what I've seen through past experiences of watching the hippos is when they're stressed, if they've had like a river in flood and it's been hectic water or if they've been hunted or if they've been poachers after them, or if they had lions after them, they get this red liquid. And Stevie came in one night and he had the red liquid and I got amazing photos of it dripping. As soon as he left that night, I shot outside because it drips onto the, the floor there, the concrete, and I touched it and it is the softest, most beautiful liquid. It's like a moisturizer, the, the probably the most expensive moisturizer in the world. And I learned, that about that particular thing. That was just one thing he taught me. The biggest thing he has taught me to date is that when they gape, I knew it, I knew it wasn't aggression. It's only aggression when they don't know you and 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 or they've been hunted or they've got hassled with people. But normally it's a hello. They open their mouth to greet animals, to greet each other, and to greet humans when they know you, or to tell you to back off if they don't know you but they show it in the eyes whether they're cross or not. Stevie would be gaping and like a meter from my hand, three feet from my hand. So I had to, the one day I had to touch him. I, I knew I shouldn't for many reasons, but after 30 years, I'm sorry, I had to. And I just held my hand for a very brief second and he touched me, but he liked it and there was no aggression. Since then, I'll, I won't tell a lie, the last couple of months before he, he went away now, now, I've touched him a couple more times, just gently on the lips, and he, he touches me and then he gets back to eating. What I've learned from him is that they, I, I've always known that they need um, lots of comforting. They, they, they're gregarious animals. 
so that the, normally they're all together and when they get kicked out like stevie they're very lonely let's put it bluntly they, they're on their own they've got no communication so when he comes in he chats to the warthogs if they're here he chats to the bush pigs he's very close to them the baboons feed right under his tummy and he's got like 50 baboons right un under him and he doesn't hurt them in the slightest he's never aggressive and it's a greeting it's a greeting this open mouth thing but people i know so many people here where we live that have said oh i've just saw that hippo down the road and he was opening his mouth and he's so aggressive we should take him out we should shoot him he's dangerous it's a load of rubbish yeah. yes they kill people but so do elephants and in 30 years of living here more people and i'm talking mainly poachers have been killed by buffalo than any other animal that's the first one secondly elephant and only two people in 30 years have been killed by hippo and not in this area and both times they were poachers so you know their reputation isn't really what they make it out to be but i, I could go on for years about that and i better shut up <laughs> And, and so then what was the situation with, with Stevie then? Um, I know that you've been posting quite regularly on, on social media that um, that he had got into a bit of a, an argument with his, was it his father? Yeah. What, what happened was, um, sadly, the, the river is, is shrunk because uh, we've lost a lot of riverine due to the, the land invasions back in 2000. So a lot of people have moved into the conservancy um which is not viable for them. It's not, it's a drought area. But anyway, they moved in and they took over a lot of the hippos' habitat in the river. So the hippos had to leave those areas because there was now lots of people, cattle, goats, sheep, you name it. And so the hippos got more and more restricted in their pools. So young males like Stevie had nowhere to go, really. Uh, he, they've got channels, but they've lost a lot of their habitat. Uh, Stevie came here regularly every night not always every night and then this last year he's been last year he was gone for a maximum of 14 days this year he's been like five days away seven days away 10 days away and then it was about it was 21 days ago 21 days today uh kuchek his father found him i think in the river because it was it was in the early hours of the morning i was fast asleep and what happened was uh, we don't have windows. We, we only have gauze. And I was woken up by the sound of thudding feet by, from my bed. And I'm looking from my bed to the, the front of the house. And I see, because it was kind of a bit of a moon, I see two hippos. And I know it's Steve and I know it's Kuchek. I'm not sort of daft. Going past at full gallop. So I leap out of bed. I grab the torch. We don't have electricity. I run through to the, the front of the room screaming at Kuchek to stop because I know what he's doing. He's trying to attack Steve. Um, I hear a crashing noise because we've got a little fence to keep the warthogs from eating Steve's lawn. Otherwise, they dig it up and break it. And we open the gate and the fence at night for him. And um, the fence goes down. I hear it go down. And then I rush to the back of the door and Steve rushes past me with Kuchek right behind him and they head for the river. So I then head to the front of the house and I can hear them going into the river and I hear them running in the river, but it's four o'clock in the morning, it's pitch dark, I can't go after them and I would have been stupid to anyway. At dawn, we sent our ranger, one of our, we have five um, rangers, which do anti-poaching and patrolling. We sent Nasha, who's a very good tracker and he found Stevie's tracks and he came back and he says, yes, he's run Basically, he'd run one and a half k's to another part in the river, and he says he's he he is bleeding. There's blood, but it's spots in his track. In the meantime, I had searched the, the garden and everywhere, and there was blood, and there was blood on the fence. There was blood in one place, um, not a lot of blood, but blood, and there was a piece of flesh um, about that big, um, probably from his thigh or his lip or it could even be from Kuchek's, I don't know. Um, and then we tracked him. We, we went where Nasher had told us and you could see that Kuchek had lost him. Stevie was now on his own. There was only one set of tracks, which was Stevie. So Stevie had got away from Kuchek and there was blood all the way along, but very small, one drop, one drop, one drop. So like I've had hippos killed here. I've had eight males killed in, in uh, 30 years, all youngsters. 
uh, one older one, a nine-year-old. I've had two shot by hunters, but I've had eight killed by natural events. And um, Stevie wasn't bleeding that would kill him. When when they are when it's hit a, a vein a, like a, like a um, a bad one, the blood is co copious, and you you will know they're not going to make it. Plus, he would never have run one and a half k's. I believe they have about 56 liters of blood in them, but he still wouldn't have made it that far. Mm -hmm. I, I've seen other hippos killed by hippos and they don't get very far. So I knew it wasn't life threatening, but I didn't know how badly he was hurt. Mm -hmm. And 21 days later, he hasn't come home. Mm -hmm. But he's been gone 14 days without getting beaten up by Cooch. Cooch came back for up till about four days ago. He's been coming in this area. He's looking for Steve. And it's not Kuchek's fault. He is a bull hippo. He is the father. It doesn't matter. He is being a hippo. And my policy with wild animals is you cannot to you can't really interfere with them, what they're yeah. doing. You can if it's in your own home, then I'll interfere. But in the bush, it's their life. They're wild. Yeah. I interfere if it's human related, if it's poachers or hunters, then I interfere because I don't believe man should kill animals. That's my policy. Um, but basically, um, Stevie hasn't come home. I still have hope. I'm hurting because I love the animal. You shouldn't love animals. You shouldn't be anthropomorphic if you're studying them, if you're running a trust. Well, to hell with that. I love him. Same. I have learned so much from that animal, more than I've learned in 30 years. Yeah. And he's very special to me. He has against him poachers, hunters, lions, hippos. Uh, droughts. He's got so many things to cope with. Yeah. I just hope he's being very intelligent, which he is, they all are, and hanging out somewhere. A lot of good people have said that to me. He's hanging out, licking his wounds. All I need is to see him, to see yeah. what damage has been done to him. And I have seen hippos with their heads split open in the middle from another hippo, where when they go underwater, it bubbles out um, from, from it being right close to the bone. I've seen hippos um, with scars in their stomachs where you think they should be dead. They heal. All yeah. wild animals, barring the little tiny delicate ones, but many of the big guys and even baboons. I've seen baboons with their jaws hanging off, with their arms hanging off from fighting yeah. each other. Within yeah. a month, they've licked it and they're totally and absolutely healed like they've been to the best hospital in the world and been stitched up. Yeah. And, and hippos are the same. So... If Kuchek has hurt him, I believe he will heal. But I need to see him. And whether he's going to come back is the big question mark because he was beaten. He was chased from the river. He wasn't chased here. But he came here for sanctuary, which really hurts me. And blooming Kuchek followed him. And I'm amazed that Kuchek even came on our front lawn because he never has in all these years. But yeah. he wants to hurt his son. And I understand it. It's natural. But for Steve's sake and for all the people that love him as well, I really want him to come home. And the minute he comes home, I shall be videoing, photographing and hitting media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, you name it. Everybody will hear. Excellent. I really hope he does, Karen. Um, <clears throat> I'm getting a bit mindful of time. Uh, so we've got a couple of questions coming through for the audience. So we'll ask those and then we'll start to start to wrap things up. Um, we've got a question coming through from someone who's based in Nigeria. Uh, that's Mohammed, and he's asking, are there any differences between how hippos live in Nigeria compared to Zimbabwe? Good question. Having never been to Nigeria, I can't tell you for sure. What I do know is I don't think, sadly, you've got many in Nigeria. I wouldn't think more than about 100 hippo at a guesstimate. There's only 125,000 hippos, and that was in the 90s that there was a record done. Um, that was a quarter of the elephant population, and they're not on the endangered Appendix 1, which they should be. There's less yeah. hippos than elephants. Um, but in Nigeria, I believe you don't have very many. I know you're a big country, a massive country, but I think you've also got a huge population. So I would assume that hippos are very limited in their habitats, which is the biggest problem for all wildlife, but especially yeah. hippo. Hippo need water to live in. And unfortunately, even here in Zim, there are not many places where hippos can live naturally, where they're not gonna be with people and eventually either be harassed by people or be too on top of people and then harass people because they're, they're, they're trapped. Yeah. 
Thank you, Karen. Uh, we've got another question coming through from Alison Jeremy. Hi, Alison. She wasn't able to join today, so she's sent a message and uh, promises to be watching when, it, when it's not live. Um, for those who are one, um, not able to watch it when it's live, do please put some questions and comments in and we'll try and get back to you and be able to respond to those, even though we won't be live at the time. Um, and she's asking, how is climate change affecting uh, where you live? Um, we're seeing change, definitely, 100%. Funny enough, we're getting actually better rain than we normally get. Um, when we moved here, we got 16 inches a year. Um, that's because we're a drought-prone area. Now we get about 20 inches. It's still not arable land. It'll never be arable, but it's better for the grazing, for the, the wildlife and the browse. Um, but we are seeing a huge change in the in the river um, in many aspects, and it is definitely having an impact. And every human being out there must do something. There's lots of literature, lots of ways of helping with climate change. We all need to make a, an issue of it. And we've got another question coming through from Faye. Hi, Faye. And she's asking, how many baby hippos have been born since you first started your hippo journey? Uh, 67. Oh, did you see that? That's Squiggle. Can you see her? I can see, see yeah. On the back of my that is Squiggle <laughs> Mongoose, everybody. She's just looked over <laughs> on live TV. <laughs> what, didn't want to miss out. There she is. <laughs> hey, Squiggle. Okay, she she was orphaned. Um, well, we found her on her own, and she came to live with us, and has never left. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, sorry, I totally lost track of your question with Squiggle arriving. <laughs> Alison, she's saying how many baby hippos? That's incredible. Sixty-seven from the original thirteen. I also brought in two hippos from another area that were going to be shot. I brought them in, and Kuchek is the offspring of the one hippo that was going to be shot in another area for interfering with um, people's crops. So we brought them into this area and Kuchek is the offspring. He, he, he's a real success story. We, we, that's one of the things the Turkey Hippo Trust does. Um, we have a website, uh, uh, which savethehippos.info, which tells you everything. It also says about the volunteering and, ah, there we are. Thank you, Kathleen. Kathleen. Uh, it, it's basically, everything we do here is from funding from you people without, the people out there, this wouldn't exist. I'm on the ground. I do the work. I'm not paid. I don't get a salary. I do this because it's my passion. But without you people, this would not exist. So please, everybody, pat yourself on the back if you've adopted or donated or in any way helped us. And you help me virtually by talking to me. I live alone here with my husband. So thank you from my heart. Excellent. I think that's a perfect place then for us to wrap up, Karen. It's such a lovely, lovely chat. It's obvious how passionate you are about these animals. You're doing an incredible job. Um, and thank you, everyone, for all your wonderful comments and kind words. It's really appreciated. Um, so before we say goodbye, Karen, is there anything that you'd like to finish with? Only that everybody, we're, we're in it together. Our world is made up of us, human beings. We are not in control, nature is, but we can make a difference and it's not too late. It's never too late if we all go for it in our, any way you can, be it a cake cell, be it a run, be it climbing a mountain, we can all make a difference. And the donations you make to any charity, be it human or animal, really matters. Without it, the people on the ground can't do what they do. And thank you, Kathleen, so much for, for having me on your show. And uh, I hope we meet. I hope you come here and meet the hippos. I absolutely plan to do exactly that. Thank you so much. And it's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Again, thank you, everyone, back home for watching. But from now, enjoy the rest of your day. Bye.